I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Good morning, friends. Thank you for joining me online this morning. Can you believe this? The first Sunday in February. But I would also just like to urge you, if you are close enough to St. Thomas, to come into our services on a Sunday. We are up and running again. We have a service at 8 o'clock, a service at 9.30. So it would be good for you to join with me in person in church as well as online. Thank you to Paul for leading us into our worship time with our reading. And then that wonderful hymn that reminded us that God, the creator of everything, is here with us, that he calls us. And uh, I'm going to read now from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through to 11. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Kephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Amen. Now, we're looking at the theme at the, at the moment of love never ends. And we say, we say that that is the challenge for us as we are being shaped into the body of Christ. So the other part of our theme is being the body of Christ. Last week, the greatest gifts of these, gift of love. And I, I shared that with you. But this week, building on that idea of the love of who God is, shaping us and forming us and creating us more and more into the image of who he is, that was the challenge from last week. At the beginning of this year, as we launch all our ministries and as we launch our services again, I want to ask you to hold firm to what you believe. So if we're going to be together, being in the body of Christ, we need to make sure we hold firm to what we believe. And I've taken that obviously from our 1 Corinthians 15 passage, verse 2. Hold firmly to the word. Love, we were told last week, is patient and kind and never-ending. Love, we said, the agape love of who God is. That love is the love that sends us in His love to the world. And you and I need to have the courage and the faith courage to go and live and to take on the world in Jesus' name and to love the world around us in the way that God loves us and shares His love for us. And the way that Jesus showed us through his life and his ministry and his teachings. We know that we don't do this on our own strength. There's the baptism of the Holy Spirit given to us 
to fill us with his love and with his gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, for us to be saved and to be shaped and to be formed by his love, sent by his love in action to transform the world. And that might sound, ah, oh, this is the same old, same old, that I've heard this before. But if your life is not changing, if the world around you is not changing, if your calling to live your life as a child of God is not changing the lives of those around you, then perhaps you need to hear the message again. We are called by God to be shaped in his love and to shape those around us in his love and to love others as he loves them, to change the world. With that in mind, that's like the, the, the foundation for our message this week. With that in mind, let's take, it a look, let's take a look at our reading for this week ahead. Remember, the Apostle Paul, through his letters, wrote to the congregation in Corinth, and that's a congregation that Paul started. He founded that. He writes his letters to them because this congregation is now in conflict with each other. So in your imagination, can you hear the arguments? Can you sense the frustrations and the angers within the body of Christ there? And what were they arguing about? About spiritual gifts. They were arguing about which gifts were the most important. Which one person which one was more important than the other because this one had this gift and that one had that gift. They were in conflict with each other about the resurrection of Jesus too. Some were saying Jesus died but he never rose again from the dead. And so with that as the backdrop to help them through this conflict, to help that congregation get moving forward, Paul writes them his letters. And in his letters, he reminds them about what they believe and why they believe it. We read that in verses 1 and 2 today. And then he gives them a list to help them remember the key points of their faith, that Jesus was born and he lived and he died, and they were witnesses to his life and to his ministry. And all that, that, all that took place there, says Paul, is based on the Hebrew Scriptures. That's what he meant when he said, and this was according to Scripture. Remember, the New Testament church did not have the Bible as we have it today. They had the Hebrew Bible, and then they began to receive letters from apostles like Paul. It were sermons, really, pastoral letters too. And so when Paul says all of this happened to fulfill Scripture, he's referring to the Hebrew Scriptures. And verses 5 and 5 through to 8, amazing to think of all those 500 or more people that saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. And so all of this summary for Paul, all of this information, hold on to what you know and what you believe. It's like this package, right? Package tied up with a string. And the string is the instruction, hold firm to the word. Everything you believe is inside this wonderful gift. But it's tied together with the instruction, hold Firm what you've heard preached about Jesus and about faith. Sometimes, friends, when God invites us into a new experience of him, when God is doing his shaping and forming work in us, a process which can become very uncomfortable and even disconcerting for us, at times like that, there's a temptation to give in Right? And what we often give in to, we give in to insecurities and, and into fear and into confusion. And in giving in to those negative elements, in so doing, we are tempted to retreat and to go back to what we knew. To go back to the comfortable, to go back to the traditional space that we have with God. And instead of doing that, and that's what Paul's warning against, he's Instead of going back to what life was before Jesus, he says, and he encourages in his letter, that we need to remember where we have come from, spiritually speaking. We need to then celebrate and own what we believe. And when we do those two things, we will get that spiritual focus and energy and power of the Holy Spirit poured into us and released through us 
for us then to do the work of the kingdom. And so I urge you to hear what I'm saying at the beginning of this new church year for us. We've spent two years in lockdown. We are now coming out of lockdown. We are determined to get going. Our theme from our congregational meeting last week, let's get going. Friends already are discerned that there's some pushback, and there's some worry, and there's some concern because we've become used to what we have. And so I'm saying to you this week, hold firm to what you believe. Hold firm to what you've heard, preached, what you've been taught, and let us together go forward in the strength of who God is. And who is God? Well, he's that agape love that we spoke about last week. A love that changes everyone and everything. I'm going to be leading us into a time from next week on where we're going to look at worship and what worship means. And by the way, that was one of the pointers raised at our, our congregational meeting. Let's explore worship. And so I'm going to take that on. From next week, you're going to hear more of that. How do we worship? What is worship? Is there a difference between praise and worship? Bear in mind, we are called to worship God, first of all. But I'll deal with that from next week. So as we go into this new time together now, there needs to be a practical way or a tool that I can share with you that will help us to both, first of all, remember our faith and then also give us that power and that strength to move forward, to, to get going for the kingdom. And what is that practical example? What's that tool? It's communion. It's the breaking of bread. It's the sharing of, of the wine at the Lord's table. It's worshipping, it is praying, it is meeting with the Lord individually and together at his table as often as we can. It's the Lord's table that cements us in our faith. When Jesus was with the disciples in the upper room on the night he was betrayed, they were celebrating the festival of unleavened bread and the Passover meal. Those two taken together. We know that from Mark chapter 14. Festival of unleavened bread and the Passover. I remind you then what the Passover stands for, what it's about. The Passover, this very important Jewish celebration that has its roots embedded in, in Hebrew history. The Passover is the time in the year to remember that God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. And if you'd like to study that, go and read Exodus chapter 12. And I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to highlight a few verses for you. Just to bring to you the importance of the place of the Passover in setting the table for us in terms of communion. Verse 1, chapter, Exodus 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month. The first month of your year. So calendar time. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, the first month of the year, each one is to take a lamb for their family. And then we go in verse 5. Those animals must be without defect. By the way, they must be male lambs. wonder what that means. Go and think about that. Take them from the sheep or the goats. And so you take them. And then on the 14th day of the month when... All the community comes together. At twilight, end of the day, you slaughter them. And here we go, verse 7. Then you are to take some of the blood of those slaughtered animals and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. And this is how you are to eat it with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. In other words, ready to get going. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And we know how the story goes, many of us. That night God passed over the people of Egypt. And for the Hebrews who had the markings of blood on the door frames of their houses, God passed over their houses without His judgment falling on them. 
but for those who did not have the covering of the blood on their doorposts. For those, there was tragedy. And Exodus tells us the firstborn of every child, Egyptian and visitor to the land, and every animal, firstborn of every animal, died that night. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And this, verse 14, is the day you are to commemorate. And you are to tell this to the generations that come, generation after generation. And then verse 17 says, don't forget about the unleavened bread either. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread because on this day I brought you out of Egypt. And so we remember that Jesus as a Jew with Hebrew history in mind is in the upper room with the disciples to celebrate the festival of unleavened bread and the Passover. But there's a kingdom shift in the tradition of the moment here. Jesus took the wine and the unleavened bread, the traditional meal elements. He blessed them and he made a new covenant. He brought in a new tradition, friends. He took something they were used to and he made something new. And we read about that in 1 Corinthians 11 from verse 23. I mean, Paul writes about this. We use this in our communion order of service. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so friends, our communion, the communion we celebrate, has its origins in Hebrew scripture. It has its origins in Hebrew history and Hebrew tradition. And yet with Jesus, communion as we celebrate it today is this mark of a new covenant too, this time we celebrate a new relationship with God. The Passover meal remembers the rescue of the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt. And that rescuing act is marked by the flesh and the blood of animals. Right? The Passover lambs and the unleavened bread. And then the communion meal, the twist that Jesus brings into that very same celebration is that he uses the, the bread and the wine, the blood and the bread, to say, remember, God rescues all people from their sin. Communion is a celebration of salvation, marked by the blood and the flesh of Jesus on the cross. And we eat with unleavened bread, our wafers, and we drink our communion wine. So friends, at the beginning of this year, as we hold firmly to what we believe, let us remember always, always, whenever we meet in worship, that communion is about the sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf to take away our sin. Communion is to remind us of the roots in our faith. Communion, friends, sets us apart from any other faith, any other religion. Communion is the bedrock example of what we believe. Hold firmly to this. Communion is our faith at worship and worship at the Lord's table. And so when we come for communion, we come to the Lord's table because we need to be rescued by Jesus, irrespective of our length of time in the faith whether we are exploring for the first time who Jesus is, whether we know who he is in our lives or not, whether we've been Christ followers for decades, we need, all of us need to be saved by the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus. And that's what communion tells us. That's what we believe. So we come to the Lord's table because we celebrate in a very public way 
what our faith is all about. Our faith, built on the love and the sacrifice of Jesus. Our faith, as we learn to worship God for who He is and how He shapes us. That is what communion is about. Remember the hymn? All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. And then we go on to say, I surrender all. I surrender all. So this year, friends, please celebrate communion as often as you can, whenever you can, wherever you can. That's very good Methodism. Wesley, Wesley had communion as part of his prayer every day. You might have heard in the recent uh, memorials around the Archbishop Desmond Tutu that he took communion every day too. And in fact, Wesley instituted what we call love feasts. A love feast is a way to celebrate communion uh, in a way that's deeply dignified and prayerful. But you don't have to wait for the minister to be there. You don't have to wait to get to church to do that. Uh, you can use elements at home like we've used during lockdown. Water and bread, for example. And in your daily devotion at home, you can say, Father, I'm here now in this feast moment to meet with you. Feed me with who you are. You might wonder then, well, if we have love feasts, why do we have communion in church? Well, very briefly, our communion in church is structured in the way that it is. Also scriptural, 1 Corinthians 11 from verse 21, where we keep order and we keep dignity in the process. The early church things went a little bit pear-shaped with communion. And Paul pulled the, the congregations back to order when they had communion in church. And so the Methodist church is built on that sense of order in communion. But that doesn't stop you from having communion, love feasts, whenever you can, wherever you can, how often you can, every day if possible. So as you hold firm to what you believe with me this year, as we go into the challenges that lie ahead, let's incorporate the love feast into our devotions and into the lives of our small groups meeting. Let's hold firmly onto the word and celebrate our faith in the word and celebrate our faith in the sacrament. That is my ordination vow. I am ordained to the word and the sacraments. The Hebrews were rescued from slavery in Egypt by the power of God and the blood of lambs. You and I are rescued from slavery to sin by the power of God and the blood of Jesus. And what helps us to remember our faith, what gives us the power to move forward, what gives us that ability to get going for the, the kingdom? Well, friends, I'm telling you, it's communion. The breaking of bread at the Lord's table. Worshipping, praying, meeting with the Lord individually, together, at His table as often as we can. Those meetings will be truly life-changing. And so as I bring this to a close, for communion, remember to bring your life honestly. Remember to bring your life as it is. Don't try and change it. Bring who you are honestly to meet with the Lord at His table. Meet with Jesus there. And then as Paul began his letter, so I will end my message for you this week. For what I received... I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Kephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also, says Paul, as to one strangely born, abnormally born. Meet with Jesus at his table and hold firm to what you believe. Amen.